And uh, the talk will be mostly about invariant subspaces of elliptic systems, so the, the study of the spectrum uh, of pseudo-differential elliptic operators and their relations to, to, to elliptic systems and to the associated uh, hyperbolic evolution. Um, I will be more, more clear about what I mean by this uh, in a few uh, moments, but before that, let me start by introducing the setting. So we will be working uh, on a closed uh, connected smooth manifold M, so compact and without boundary, of dimension at least two, so greater than or equal to two, uh, and uh, we denote by x1, xd, the local coordinates on M. And uh, we will be working uh, on, so our operators or our function spaces will be spaces of M columns of L2 complex valued half densities. So M columns where each entry is uh, an L2 complex valued half density. And, and I denote with a slight abuse of notation, this space by L2, L2M. So L2M are not half densities or L2 functions, but M columns of L2 half densities. Uh, one could uh, develop a similar theory for scalar functions, but I don't do it here just to make my life easier for the sake uh, of the talk. Um, and we, we equip uh, L2M uh, with the usual uh, inner product. This is an intrinsic inner product without uh, an auxiliary density because uh, we are working on half densities indeed. And throughout the, throughout the talk, the star denotes Hermitian conjugation. And we will be considering uh, classical pseudo-differential operators um, of a, a positive uh, order S. Uh, which uh, are assumed to be elliptic, namely the determinant of their principal symbol is nowhere vanishing on the punctured cotangent bundle, and they will be self-adjoint as operators from HS to L2. And again, HS is the higher order subolev space of M columns uh, of uh, complex valued half densities, which are HS. We introduce an additional assumption, um, namely we <clears throat> assume uh, that uh, the eigenvalues of the principal symbol of our operator A are simple. So this is, um, this is uh, <clears throat> somehow a crucial assumption that enters in many of the arguments uh, that I will be presenting later. So it's, I won't make it explicit all the time, but this is a really crucial assumption. So uh, a little bit more of notation. So we denote by M plus and M minus the number of positive and negative eigenvalues of the principal symbol of A, respectively. Uh, these will be smooth functions on the cotangent, on the cotangent bundle. Uh, and M plus and M minus are constants uh, bec because of the ellipticity condition. So these are either, so the eigenvalues of the principal symbol are either strictly positive or strictly negative. So the number of positive eigenvalues and negative eigenvalues are, are constants. We denote the eigenvalues of the principal symbol by Hj. Uh, these are also smooth functions on the cotangent bundle. Uh, and uh, we enumerate, uh, for, for the enumeration J, we choose positive index ranging from one to M plus for positive eigenvalues and negative index ranging from mi minus one to M minus for negative eigenvalues. Uh, and we denote by Pj uh, the eigenprojection uh, corresponding to Hj with the same rule for enumeration. So again, positive for eigenprojections corresponding to positive eigenvalue and negative for eigenprojections corresponding to negative eigenvalues. <clears throat> As a consequence of the elliptic condition, again, we have that m, m plus plus m minus sum precisely to m, which is the size of our pseudo m, m by m pseudo differential operator. Uh, the sum of the eigenprojections is the identity matrix, uh, and the principal symbol of the operator can be written using the spectral theorem in terms of its eigenvalues and its eigenprojections uh, in this way. So in, in this talk, we, we, we will be interested in studying three objects and, and investigating somehow the, their relations, so how, how they're interconnected and what their properties are. Uh, and the three objects are the following. So the first objects we will be looking at are the way, is the wave propagator of A, of our uh, pseudo-differential uh, system or pseudo-differential matrix operator. And if, for these, I, I will restrict myself when looking at propagators to the case S equal one, to first order pseudo-differential operators. One can look at higher order ones, uh, adding some additional conditions on the operator itself. I don't want to do it here. So whenever 
propagators are involved, I will assume that they are, the operator is first order. And the propagator is the one parameter family of unitary operators defined as by this formula. So e to the minus i a t. We will then be interested in, in, in variants of spaces of L2 under the action of A. So, and uh, I will make, uh, be more precise later about what this means. And the third object that we will be studying is the spectrum of A. And when, when looking at object two and object three, we will not make any assumption on the order of, so of the two differential operator, any arb arbitrary positive order will do. Uh, and these, these three objects are very closely connected but distinct, and we can study their properties somehow in a unified setting. Uh, my, my talk is based on joint work uh, with a number of people, draws from joint work with a number of people, but is mostly uh, based on the last uh, three papers, so joined with Dima Vasiliev. Uh, so one which is a preprint, which is available on the archive, and the other two that are currently in preparation. Uh, there are previous papers which um, I draw upon, but they're, they're not really, they don't really enter very much into this talk. So let me start from the propagators then. Uh, and for the sake of concreteness, uh, I will not start in full generality, but I will look at a specific uh, example just to get a feel for it. So I will restrict myself uh, to begin with to the case of a three-dimensional manifold, closed and orientable, uh, equipped with a Riemannian metric. Uh, <clears throat> and I will look at the propagator for the a very specific operator A, which will be the massless Dirac operator, which will be defined in a minute. In order to define the operator, I need some auxiliary objects. So since we have a, an orientable uh, three manifold, this is automatically parallelizable. So we have at our disposal a global framing EJ, so three orthonormal vector fields. Uh, EJ, J from one to three. And I denote by S1, S2, and S3 the usual Pauli matrices. Um, using the framing and the Pauli matrices, so by projecting uh, the Pauli matrices along the framing, I, I can construct vector functions valued in trace free two by two Hermitian matrices in this way. So I denote by Ej alpha, the alpha component of the jth vector field, and I sum over J, uh, contracting with the Pauli matrices Sj. And this produces the sigma alpha, which are uh, functions with this vector matrix valued functions with these properties with the vector index alpha. Once we have these uh, functions at our disposal, we can define the massless Dirac operator as a two by two differential operator explicitly given by this formula, which is a first order operator. You see this uh, vector function sigma alpha and uh, the Christoffel symbol uh, and derivative of these vector functions. Uh, this is uh, not really the usual massless Dirac operator. This is a slightly twisted version because I wanted to, half on, to act on half densities to conform with the previous setting. But there is, there, there, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between operators acting on scalar functions and half densities. So if one drops this term here, this very last term, this becomes the usual Dirac operator acting on columns of complex valued scalar functions, which corresponds to the Dirac operator that geometers usually write down in terms of Clifford algebras and spin bundle and so on. So this is just an explicit user-friendly version of that. Uh, this, uh, one can check uh, by direct computation that this is an elliptic operator and, it's, and that is self-adjoint uh, as an operator from H1 to L2. As we are working on a closed manifold, the spectrum is discrete and the eigenvalues accumulate to both plus and minus infinity. Um, the Dirac operator has a lot of symmetry in it, so one can show, for example, from the, from the fact that it commutes with a charge conjugation operator, an antilinear operator, uh, that all uh, eigenspaces uh, have multiplicity, so in particular, even multiplicity, so they're at least of dimension two. All right, now we have uh, at our disposal our Dirac operator W, and we can construct the associated initial, hyperbolic initial value problem. So we complement it with time, and we write minus i the t plus w equals zero. This is the massless Dirac equation with some prescribed initial condition at time equals zero. And uh, we define the propagator 
uh, to be the solution operator to this uh, hyperbolic initial value problem. So it is the operator e to the minus i w t, which maps initial data to full solutions for this problem. Um, using, using the functional calculus, one can write down an explicit formula for the propagator in this way, uh, where lambda k's are the eigenvalues of w and vk, the eigenfunctions. Mm -hmm. So uh, by looking at, at this, at this formula, one can see that th this propagator has a certain structure in it. So one can identify three pieces uh, uh, of this propagator or three contributions. One which we denote by u plus, uh, u naught and u minus. And u plus is obtained by summing over, in this decomposition, over positive eigenvalues only. u naught, and this is called the positive propagator, u naught is obtained by summing over uh, zero eigenvalues only, and this is called the zero mode propagator. And u minus is obtained by summing over negative eigenvalues only, and we call this the negative propagator. So we have the, the Dirac propagator that decomposes into three uh, operators. Uh, and the first question we are interested in asking ourselves is can we write down u of t explicitly? Uh, now, one might say, well, you did it in the previous slide. So here is the formula. What else uh, do you want? So it, it, on the one hand, it is true that this is an explicit formula. But on the other hand, writing down uh, the propagator u of t precisely, to write it down precisely, one needs to know eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of the Dirac operator explicitly, which is unrealistic to expect for a general Riemannian manifold. So. Um, one can hope to write down this operator approximately, say modulo an integral operator with infinitely smooth kernel, um, in an explicit way, uh, where explicit means uh, up to solving at most ordinary differential equations. Um, and in order to do this, one has to use a microlocal analysis, for example, uh, and one has to use <coughs> a special type of operator. So this is a Mm, the, the, the propagator is a special type of operator known as Fourier integral operator. Uh, and for those who are not familiar with this type of operator, here is a, a one-liner, a very uh, imprecise explanation of what they are. So suppose you are solving the wave equation, uh, the wave equation uh, on um, an Euclidean, Euclidean space, then you can use the Fourier transform and you end up, if you do it, it's, it's a one-liner, you end up with an expression like this. Uh, yeah, when, when you start solving your solution. The, the, this expression will enter in your solution. And you see that this is e to the i times some function of x, y, t, and eta. A free integral operator is uh, something, something that very much resembles this expression. Uh, and the, it's, um, these are operators or, that were originally, uh, it's okay, they have a long history, but they, they help people solve uh, partial differential equations when Fourier transform simply doesn't work, say, when we are on manifolds. And they are operator with wh whose integral kernel has this structure. So e to the i phi, where phi is called phase function, which is a function that satisfies certain properties with the same variable, so a generalization of this guy here, a fast oscillating function, times a slowly oscillating function a, which is called amplitude or symbol, and everything is integrated in eta. So this is the uh, short story of what free integral operators are. These are very complicated operators and dealing with them is not easy. But somehow using free integral operators, one can construct propagators to hyperbo for hyperbolic problems. And there are classical constructions due to Hormander and Trev that use microlocal techniques uh, and other constructions, for example, due to Hadamard that are not really microlocal in spirit, but one can write down explicitly, explicitly in the sense uh, that I described above, the propagator for such an operator. Now, the problem with the classical uh, constructions, uh, the classical constructions have a certain, uh, some issues. Uh, so the first issue is that they are local. So usually this what, what happens is what one chooses a coordinate patch and does calculations there. But I don't want to work in local charts and patch them together. As a result of being local, these constructions are usually not invariant. Uh, what do I mean by this? Uh, the, the objects that appear in these oscillatory integrals, this function a and so on, they're, 
they depend on choice of coordinates and they're not invariantly defined. So I change coordinates and these objects change. And this means that I, I don't have a way to uh, uniquely or canonically identify what this A is or what this phi is. And this is somehow a little bit unsatisfactory. And the third issue, which is perhaps the most serious one, uh, is that classical constructions only work for small times. And this is due to obstructions, uh, due to caustics, namely geodesics focusing together. And effectively, if one wants to use the classical constructions to build a propagator, one has to construct the propagator for small times and then start composing several operators. So from uh, T naught to T1, then from T1 to T2, until you reach the time uh, desired. The, the, the problem in this is that one has to start composing Fourier integral operators and composing Fourier integral operators is a, a dreadful and daunting task and hoping to get, uh, and it's practically hopeless to get anything explicit out of a composition of uh, Fourier integral operators. Perhaps one can get uh, principal symbols, but anything beyond that uh, requires uh, a lifetime of computation. So one would like to somehow construct these propagators uh, in such a way to overcome these issues. And the way to do this uh, is provided by uh, some uh, results due to Laptev, Safarov and Vasilyev in the 90s, who suggested to uh, consider for integral operators where this function phi is not real valued, but complex valued. So we add uh, an imaginary part, a, a positive uh, imaginary part to it. Uh, and this miraculously solves uh, uh, all the problems somehow. One can, uh, one does not uh, have issues with caustics anymore and one can construct uh, an operator which works for, for all times. Um, so uh, building on the results of Laptev, Safarov and Vasiliev, uh, <clears throat> what we can do to, to construct uh, these um, propagators uh, globally, invariantly, and for all times, is to fix a distinguished complex valued phase function, uh, which is somehow uh, geometrically meaningful or dictated by the geometry, and set up an algorithm that invariantly determines and uniquely determines a scalar amplitude A, which, uh, which, which will then be well defined for all times. Since we're working on a Riemannian manifold, we can uh, identify such uh, a distinguished geometric phase function, which we call Levi-Civita phase function, uh, and it is con which is constructed as follows. So we can see with a node by X star and Xi star, the Hamiltonian flow uh, of uh, this Hamiltonian, which is the positive eigenvalue of the principal symbol of the Dirac operator, so the modulus of momentum. This is a Hamiltonian on the cotangent bundle. We can study, we can look at the associated Hamiltonian flow with initial condition y eta. And we can define a phase function which comprise a real part and an imaginary part uh, based on the Hamiltonian flow, uh, the Hamiltonian and geodesic distance square. Uh, so th this phase function somehow is uh, defined uniquely from, from the geometry and it has some special properties. Namely, it straightens out the geometry in an optimal way, in a sense. Uh, and it makes the Laplace Beltrami operator a partial differential operator with almost constant coefficients. And okay, precise uh, mathematical statement of what I've uh, now said in imprecise terms uh, are written here. <clears throat> but the, the take home me message is that this is a geometric phase function, which is uniquely defined. Um, and uh, it has an imaginary part. And we can, if we accept to fix this distinguished, to work with this fixed distinguished phase function, then uh, we can show that we can construct uh, the, positive, uh, the, the positive and the negative propagators of the Dirac operator can be approximated by a single oscillatory integral, global in space and in time, with such phase function, uh, with a, an amplitude which is uh, invariantly and uniquely determined by a, a prescribed explicit algorithm. Uh, and we have to throw into somehow additional functions here. We have a cutoff and a weight, which are somehow technical objects which I don't want to discuss. But the bottom line is that we can write this as a single integral with more or less the same structure as the one uh, I discussed before.
<clears throat> so what is the advantage of fixing a distinguished phase function? So the advantage is that A, we can do uh, calculations. The objects that we obtain are invariant, and we can make sense of a notion of full symbol and sub-principal symbol for a Fourier integral operator, which are usually uh, not defined in literature because there is no uh, uh, good way of defining them. But for a special type of Fourier integral operators like uh, the propagators with the distinguished choice of phase function, uh, such a definition becomes viable and meaningful. Uh, and we have uh, an explicit algorithm and we, we can provide explicit formula, say for the principal symbol and sub-principal symbol uh, of this operator in terms of purely geometric invariance. All right, so this was uh, a short story of what happens for the Dirac operator, but one can uh, carry out a similar argument for uh, general M by M matrix to differential operators, uh, as long as the principal symbol has simple eigenvalues. So one can define the propagator um, like this, as before, and one can again decompose it into three objects, the positive propagator, the negative propagator, uh, sorry, the, the zero mode propagator and the negative propagator. And one can prove a similar result, namely the positive propagator uh, is approximated by precisely M plus oscillatory integrals, global in space and in time, and each of them is associated to one of the eigenvalues of, of the positive eigenvalues of the principal symbol of A. And the negative propagator can be approximated modulo an integral operator with infinitely smooth kernel by precisely a minus oscillatory integrals global in space and in time. And each of them is associated to one uh, of the negative eigenvalues of the principal symbol. So somehow the positive eigenvalues of the principal symbol account for the positive spectrum of A and the negative eigenvalues of the principal symbol account for the negative spectrum of A. Now, a natural question is, can we do better than this? You see, here we uh, bundle all positive eigenvalues together and all negative eigenvalues together. So a natural question to ask is, can we obtain a finer classification of the spectrum of A? Namely, can we, is it possible in some way to partition, say, the, 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 the spectrum of A into M disjoint families of eigenvalues one corresponding to each eigenvalue of the principal symbol of our operator. Uh, and this will be interesting in many uh, respects. Uh, so in order to explain how to do this and why this is interesting, I need to uh, discuss uh, pseudo-differential projections. So what is a pseudo-differential projection? Um, I call pseudo-differential projection or orthogonal pseudo-differential projection, a zero-order pseudo-differential operator that satisfies these two conditions. So it is idempotent, so p squared equals p, up to a smoothing operator, um, and uh, it is a self-adjoint, p star equals p, modulo a smoothing operator. Uh, and I say that a set or a collection of m orthonormal pseudo-differential projections uh, as per previous definition, is a pseudo-differential basis if, in addition to this, their principal symbol are rank one matrix functions and they satisfy these two conditions. So they're orthonormal, modulo, a smoothing operator, and they sum to the identity operator. <clears throat> now, uh, pseudo-differential projections are very natural objects, if one think about it. Um, and the, the word pseudo-differential projections appears in various papers, but somehow we were unable to find uh, a detailed or, or any proper description of them. Uh, people who use pseudo-differential projections, as far as we uh, uh, could uh, ascertain, uh, mostly deal with principal symbols uh, and never bother to look at what happens further down uh, the line. Um, and if one thinks about it, there are some questions uh, uh, to answer at the very beginning, as, as soon as one states the definition. So the first question is, do such operators exist? Um, already, if we look at a, at a single operator, this is not a priori clear. Um, and the reason why it is not a priori clear is if it, one tries to write down 
the conditions that the symbol of such operators needs to satisfy, one realizes immediately that one needs to solve an infinite sequence of heavily overdetermined systems of algebraic equations. And the fact that such a heavily overdetermined system have a solution uh, is not immediately clear. Uh, and and the heavy, heavy overdetermination already happens when one starts to impose the first condition. The next question is, all right, but we want to do something with this, the differential projection. So can we construct them in such a way that they are compatible with the operator A, namely so that they commute with A, always modulo psi minus infinity. Uh, and if this is to happen, then we, it is natural to ask that the principal symbol of two differential projections are exactly the eigenprojections of the principal symbol of A. Uh, and assuming that one can solve the heavily overdetermined system, that one can also impose uh, the commutation with our uh, positive order elliptic operator, uh, two differential operator A, um, one can ask, uh, are such uh, pseudo-differential operators uniquely defined um, by A or not? Um, somehow establishing existence of these operators uh, is not something that one can do by looking um, at elementary functional analytic uh, arguments involving eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, but one really needs to look at the pseudo-differential uh, side of the matter. Um, Okay, here is the theorem. Uh, such pseudo-differential operators, such basis of pseudo-differential projections does indeed exist. One can solve uh, the uh, heavily overdetermined system. And in fact, uh, it is enough to satisfy these three conditions, namely the compatibility with A and the idempotency condition, P square equals A, and the other two conditions are automatically satisfied. So they're automatically orthonormal and they automatically sum to the identity as soon as these three conditions are met. Uh, and furthermore, they're uniquely determined uh, modulo psi minus infinity by the operator A. So we, we give the operator A and we have a basis of two differential projections uniquely determined by it. Uh, and we have an explicit algorithm that allows us to construct the full symbol of the PJs explicitly in terms of the full symbol of A and an explicit formula for the sub-principal symbol as well. Uh, just to give you uh, a flavor uh, of what's going on, I will just show what the principal symbol of two differential projections looks like. Uh, this is not just for the sake of showing horrible formula, but uh, knowing uh, the sub-principal symbol of two differential projections is really useful in applications. For example, uh, these enters, uh, the matrix, matrix trace of this object enter in the second bio coefficient of the counting function of A. Uh, and somehow the failure to realize this uh, uh, led to 30 years of incorrect publication. So, of course, uh, with hindsight, we can now see that this mistake was um, mistakes, for example, that Safarov made in computing the second bio coefficients were due to failing to realize that the sub-principal symbol of PJ is not zero, but in fact, it has a pretty, is very much non-zero and it has a complicated structure that enters uh, in the formula for the second bulk coefficient. I will try to show it later. And this is one of the differences in the spectral theory of systems that is not there for scalar equations. And as you see, the sub-principal symbol is uniquely determined by uh, the principal and sub-principal symbols of A, the eigenprojections and the eigenvalues, nothing else. So the reason why uh, eigenprojections, uh, uh, um, sorry, pseudo-differential projections are useful uh, in studying the spectral theory of elliptic systems is that they have some very good uh, positivity properties. Uh, namely, if we take, if we construct projections compatible with the operator A, as I described above, uh, then, this operator, pj star a pj, is non-negative modulo psi minus infinity when j is positive, and it is non-positive modulo psi minus infinity when j uh, is negative. Uh, so effectively, this means that this will allow us in a minute to um, study, to, to de decompose the spectrum of our operator, and these are very important uh, relations. Uh, and again, these relations 
are not uh, absolutely trivial to establish because these operators are not elliptic. Uh, all we know is that the principal symbol is, for example, if we look at this, is non-negative, uh, but we don't know very much else. Uh, we have really to look at the structure of these operators and their relation with A. Knowing that the principal symbol is non-negative doesn't, uh, in principle, even allow us to, uh, say, establish that these operators are semi-bound, for example. Um, as a corollary of this uh, result, we can uh, recover uh, known results about, say, the heaviside function of an elliptic system, so that the heaviside function of an elliptic pseudo-differential operator is a pseudo-differential operator, and this follows in a straightforward manner from the above uh, results. Uh, and uh, knowing, since we now have at our disposal uh, a construction a formula, a construction for the full symbol of projections, then we know the full symbol, a construction of the full symbol uh, of the heaviside function of an operator A. And the same is true for the modulus of absolute differential operators very much in the same way. Uh, again, using two differential projections uh, uniquely determined by the operator A itself. And again, one can use the results on two differential projections to obtain information about the full symbol of modulus of A. And here is, for example, the formula for the sub-principal symbol. Now, but let us go back to where we started and let's use these projections to study, to do some spectral theory. Um, let me uh, remind, remind you of a, a few basic facts about um, the spectral theory of elliptic systems. So uh, elliptic systems, so studying the spectrum of elliptic systems is not the same of studying the spectrum of uh, scalar uh, operators. These, uh, there are fundamental differences. One of them we've already seen uh, before. So, uh, so first of all, so the spectrum uh, of uh, the operator A uh, is uh, of course discrete because uh, it's an elliptic operator on a closed manifold and it is unbounded. Uh, and the, the nature of the unbounded, unboundedness is ruled by the, uh, by the sign of the eigenvalues of the principal symbol. So if n plus is greater or equal than one, so if we have at least one positive eigenvalue of the principal symbol, then the spectrum accumulates to plus infinity. If we have at least one negative eigenvalue of the principal symbol, then the spectrum accumulates to minus infinity. So semi-boundedness means that either all eigenvalues are positive or all eigenvalues are negative. Uh, and again, th there are certain differences between systems and scalar operators. <clears throat> uh, for example, we can look uh, at a certain number of effects, say bulk effects, uh, namely the fact that the second valve coefficient can be non-zero even in the absence of a boundary, which is not the case for scalar operators. Uh, we have gauge transformations, effects due to multiple eigenvalues of the principal symbol and so on. Uh, and if we look at the case, say, S equal one, so first order systems, uh, fairly recently it was established a formula for the second valve coefficient, so two terms asymptotics for the counting function of A by Chervova, Downs, and Vasiliev. Um, and uh, the formula for the second valve coefficient is written here. Uh, I don't want to discuss it, but I will just say that it's a pretty uh, complicated formula, and this accounts for all of the positive eigenvalues uh, of the operator A, say the positive counting function or the negative counting function. Uh, and the red bit is precisely, with hindsight, the trace uh, of the sub-principal symbol of pseudo-differential projections. So this is something really useful to have. Um, now, uh, as I said before, we want to understand whether we can partition the spectrum into m disjoint families of eigenvalues, one for each eigenvalue of the principal symbol of A. Uh, let's start, let's assume that we partition the positive eigenvalues. Doing the negative is the same, you just consider minus the operator. So since we, we want to have something to partition, we assume that the eigenvalues of the principal symbol are at least two. So m plus is greater than or equal to two. Um, and if one wants to uh, study, uh, if one wants to use the differential projection and say, well, okay, well, one can just do this, conjugate A by PJ, and look at the spectral asymptotics for this object. And hopefully some partitioning of the eigenvalues will come out. Unfortunately, one cannot do this because standard te techniques do not work uh, because this operator is not elliptic. Uh, the principal symbol will have uh, 
uh, one uh, eigenvalue, which is um, uh, hj, and the other eigenvalues will be zero. So this is uh, very much not elliptic, and the usual elliptic theory does not work, and the standard techniques on spectral asymptotics do not work. So um, in order to achieve this uh, partitioning of the spectrum, we need to do something cleverer. Uh, and what we do is the following. So we define some auxiliary operators, aj, which are obtained from a as follows. So we start from the operator a, and we subtract two times pl, apl, for all positive l's different from j. And if you look carefully at, what, at what's happening here, we are constructing an operator from A, flipping the sign of all positive eigenvalues of the principal symbol apart from HJ. Because you see, we subtract two times this object. And if you compute the principal symbol, you will realize that this is again an elliptic operator, but simpler than what we started from, because it will now have only one positive eigenvalue in its principal symbol and all, all the others are negative. And these terms effectively flips all the positive eigenvalues, but the j one. Uh, the hope, uh, okay, this uh, very much messes up uh, the operator a, but the hope is that the, the positive eigenvalues of a j are very close to the positive eigenvalues of a. And if we construct a j for all j's and collect all such eigenvalues, we can reconstruct the whole spectrum of a. So let us denote by lambda 1j, lambda 2j, lambda kj, the positive eigenvalues of the operator aj, enumerated in increasing order with a count of multiplicity. So again, aj is obtained from a by subtracting this operator, pl, apl, where l for all positive l is different from j. Then we have two theorems. So the first one tells us uh, that um, we have these results, namely that the positive uh, spectrum of A uh, approximates well lambda kj with very high accuracy, so order k minus infinity as k tends to infinity. And with some work, one can also prove the converse, namely that if we take the union of the positive spectra of the Aj's for all j's, all positive j's, this approximates well, namely, uh, or up to O k minus infinity, the spectrum of our original operator A. So one might say, well, this uh, achieves the partitions you wanted, right? So um, the spectrum of A is approximated by the, by the, the spectrum of AJ is a positive spectrum of AJ is approximated by the spectrum of A, and the union of the spectra uh, of uh, the AJ is approximates the spectrum of A. Unfortunately, this is not enough uh, to achieve a partition of the spectrum. And the issue is to do with the spectral clusters and with the uh, particular enumeration we have. Uh, these two theorems establish a closeness of the spectra of the operators, but they do not establish closeness of single eigenvalues. So in particular, we may have huge clusters uh, of growing uh, uh, size, uh, that somehow invalidate our assumption that we have, in fact, a partitioning of the spectrum. So let us combine now uh, our sequences, our, our positive eigenvalues of the operators aj for positive j into one single sequence of eigenvalues. And let us denote it by mu1, mu2, mu k. Um, then we can prove the following result. For any negative alpha, there exists a shift R alpha such that the eigenvalue lambda k equals the eigen eigenvalue mu k. So lambda k is the eigenvalue of the original operator, and mu k is this new sequence uh, comprising a union of the eigenvalues of the aj's, uh, plus a remainder order of k alpha. For every alpha, as k tends to plus infinity. So these results can be established by looking very carefully at what happens uh, uh, with clusters, so taking very small spectral windows, and one can show that this uh, is indeed the case. So uh, <clears throat> the above results establishes, uh, uh, these results establishes a number of facts. So first, 
um, uh, the the spectral the spectral projections uh, decompose L two into invariant subspaces uh, of the eigen of the <clears throat> into invariant subspaces of the operator A modulo uh, C infinity. Uh, and furthermore, uh, the, the same pseudo differential projections achieve a partition of the spectrum of A into uh, <clears throat> m distinct families of eigenvalues, one for each eigenvalue of the principal symbol. And one can use these two results to obtain refined spectral asymptotics uh, for the counting function of A. Uh, instead of obtaining a counting function for the whole positive eigenvalues, one can look at what happens. Uh, what are the contributions from these families, uh, these joint families of eigenvalues? Um, okay, I'm reaching, uh, I'm reaching the end of my talk. So uh, I, I will just uh, go back uh, to where I started and discuss propagators again. Um, so the invariant subspaces uh, under the action of the operator A turns out to be also invariant subspaces under the hyperbolic evolution of the associated propagator. Uh, namely, one can show that uj, that is the oscillatory integral associated to the j eigenvalue of the principal symbol, is precisely uh, the composition of the propagator with the j pseudo differential projection. Uh, and also the other way around, of course. Uh, up, to any, up to an operator with infinitely smooth kernel. So this allows us somehow to establish, uh, <clears throat> uh, to, est to refine uh, our construction of the propagators and understand uh, which eigenvalues uh, precisely are responsible for which oscillatory integrals uh, that, that form the positive and the negative uh, propagators. And as you see from this expression, let me go back, okay, here. So uh, the, the left-hand side here, these are functional analytic objects, if you wish, can be written in terms of eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. And the right-hand side are not really functional analytic objects. These are uh, free integral operators and they very much capture the propagation of singularity theory of a hyperbolic problem. And the two worlds, uh, it is not obvious that the two worlds always uh, speak to each other and how to achieve one from the other. Uh, and we tried, but somehow there doesn't seem to be a very natural way to uh, achieve a decomposition of the propagator in functional and analytic way, because this is really to do with the, it, it's really a pseudo differential or free integral operator uh, issue. And it is to do with pro propagation of singularities rather than with the spectral theorem. Uh, and this is why somehow pseudo differential projections play a big role uh, in this game. Um, I think I will stop here. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Matteo, for this very nice talk.